This is Duke University. All right, so let's initiate the call. Oh, look at those hats. <laughs> Um, so, so let me quickly introduce the actors that are uh, revealed themselves on uh, Great Duke fans. This is um, um, sitting in uh, San Jose. We have uh, John Chambers and John Doerr. I'll give a uh, formal introduction to them in a minute. Um, sitting in um, some, sometime soon in Delhi is Tony O'Driscoll, although you can't see him. Um, sitting in Delhi are actually some, uh, some CCMBA students, right, um, who have joined Correct. us. And, uh, and it's great to have them. Uh, and then we're here in Durham, right? And this is the first time something of this has ever been done in a university anywhere in the world, which is really, really, really very cool. Uh, there's some people I should point out, just so John and John, you know uh, who's listening to you on our end. Um, we have President Broadhead, um, who I'll ask to make a few comments in a minute. Um, sitting beside him is Peter Lang. Um, and then we have a row of deans and important people beside them. If you could put your hands up so they could see. Um, and, and also, one other person I want to highlight, which is Tracy Futhi. Tracy, if you could just stand up, please. Um, Tracy. <laughs> Tracy's the CIO for Duke and has been instrumental in getting this to happen for us. And as she and her team and then the uh, vendors who have supported that team. It's just a remarkable job getting this to happen for us. So thank you, Tracy. Um, before we introduce the, the panel speakers, so oh, Tony's here now. Um, before we introduce the panel speakers, if I could, Dick, could you make a comment or two? Would you mind? And, and, and by the way, Dick, you have to push and hold the button. I'll do it. If that's beyond you, this whole technology is hopeless. Uh, let, let me just say what a huge uh, pleasure, I'd even go so far as to say thrill, it is for all of us to be here on this occasion uh, trying out these new toys that will soon be part of just the way everyone carries on every transaction every day. Uh, and John, I would say to you, I sat in your office. I can't verify that it's the very same office you're now sitting in. Uh, but I visited <laughs> you in November of this year. Uh, yeah. And just to walk around your headquarters and see these things when they're still in the phase of close closely held wonders, uh, and now all of a sudden here today, they begin to enter the world of everyday life with all the benefits that will have for us for teaching and communication in all of its forms. Uh, the amazing thing is we've all participated in earlier versions of this technology, uh, and you strain at their crudeness. Uh, but now I look at you guys, uh, you actually respond in real time uh, to our <laughs> gestures. Uh, look at John Doerr's smile, for instance, you know? Uh, <laughs> see? See? There it is. Uh, uh, and so it turns turns out uh, that when far away from each other, we need not be absent. It's just great. And I, I so much thank you uh, for giving this university the chance to be in the forefront of these developments. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dave. So let's get started. Uh, it's, it, it really, they don't really need introduction, but I think it, it's important to sort of put in context the three people who are going to have the discussion with each other. And let me just simply forewarn you, John Doerr is actually stealing time he does not have, and we have him until 2.30. And so we're going to try to give John uh, a little bit more of the airtime in the beginning um, because the rest of us will be here. So what that translates to is I have a half an hour worth of conversation, and then um, we'll switch to Q&A, and maybe we can get a couple of minutes of Q&A for John just before he leaves. But let me introduce your panel. John Chambers is chairman and CEO of Cisco. He joined Cisco in 1991 as senior VP of worldwide sales and operations, was appointed CEO in 1995. In November 2006, John was named chairman of the board in addition to a CEO role. He's helped the company grow, this is really quite astounding, John, from 1.2 billion to its current rate of $36 billion. Um, uh, nice work. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's, you have some affiliation with Duke, and I just want you to know you're almost as good as our basketball team and how you perform. Um, John's Congratulations received versus Georgia Tech, by the way. Yeah, hey, hey, hey. Hey. And Carolina is next. And I just want you to know the deal is he'll do this provided he gets tickets to Carolina. Um, 
<laughs> so so uh, all sorts of awards and recognitions. But I think to sort of put John in perspective, just have to think about this. Time Magazine named him one of the 100 most influential people in the world um, recently. And US News named him one of America's best leaders of all variety. I think it's just incredibly deserved to think about the effect he's had on not just the world of, of the business he's engaged in, but, but the larger sense. He's received awards for diversity, inclusion, corporate philanthropy. He takes a huge role in, um, in initiatives of social responsibility around the world. Um, prior to Cisco, he was at Wang Laboratories for eight years and six years at IBM. Um, he loves business, he loves education, he loves health care, and therefore he's here. John Doerr um, joined Intel in 1974, just when the 8080 was being invented. Um, a bunch of you have no idea what I just said. Um, <laughs> But for those of us who remember that date, uh, you actually had to be 10 when this happened, John. For those of us who remember that date, uh, it was the 8-bit eight, eight microprocessor, first 8-bit microprocessor that actually had the whole thing take off. Um, he had engineering roles, marketing roles, management roles, and was one of their top sales executives. Um, in 1980, he joined Kleiner, Perkins, Caulfield, and Byers and sponsored some trivial investments of the following form. Compact, Cypress, Intuit, Netscape, Lotus, Millennium Pharmaceuticals, S3, Sun Microsystems, Amazon.com, Semantic, and Google. <laughs> right, so you should be so lucky as venture capitalists. Um, astounding um, work he's done. Uh, he's the founding CEO of Silicon Compilers, currently soars on the board of directors of Amazon.com and Google, and a ton of privately held companies like Zazzle, Miezzle, um, Bloom Energy, and Spatial Photonics. He holds patents for computer memory devices. He invented as a design engineer at Monsanto. His interests include public education, prevention of global infectious disease, and the protection of the environment. He was born in St. Louis, holds a bachelor and master's from Rice and an MBA from Harvard Graduate School of Business. Uh, we will let him come back and get Gemba and graduate from the right school. Um, it just, just the thing that's astounding is just the genius that sits in the man, uh, if you think about the range of things he's done and the effect he's had on the world, sitting on that center screen is a huge percentage of the innovation that's occurred in the United States in the last 20 years. And so we are honored to have the two of you here. Tony O'Driscoll, I'm not going to give you the same lengthy introduction. Sorry, Tony. Um, I was getting a bit worried. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we will after you've done what they've achieved. Um, Tony's one of our own, professor of the practice at Duke. Um, he conducts and teaches research in areas of strategy and technology. And he's especially interested in how the new technology that's evolving the world is changing the nature of education. That's his passion. Um, we stole him from uh, NC State and IBM. And we're lucky. Uh, he's been a great addition to the, to the school. He's got an EDD in organizational learning and MS in management for North Carolina State. And he got his uh, double E degree from Virginia Tech. And then we have four we'll students. UNC. Yes. <laughs> we have four students on the panel um, who are also coming to us from Delhi, right? You're all in the same room, I think, right? Okay. And we're delighted to have you. For the full-time MBA students, I want you to know that these are your CCMBA brethren and sisters, so um, please welcome them. All right, you ready to get started? Ready so, to go. All right, so John and John, if we could, do you mind just sort of, first of all, just doing a little bit of the context of Cisco and where Cisco's going, and your idea about how that connects to things like education and healthcare? Well, we were a company that uh, focused on providing plumbing and plumbing of the internet, right area to be in, but we were behind the scenes. And uh, where we're going now is to move to a company that provides an architectural approach to change education, healthcare, business process, both from a technology as well as from a business process change perspective. Uh, the last two weeks are probably a very good example of that. We've, I've been personally in five uh, emerging countries from Saudi Arabia to UAE, including Dubai and Abu Dhabi, up to Bahrain, into the World Economic Forum. We've met with about five or six heads of state uh, there. Uh, back here, did our earnings. Uh, very good economic scenario for Great capital quarter. spending. Not a bad quarter, John. And uh, <laughs> then we were at the White House yesterday and back here. And the point that I'm making with that is just to add substance behind we're a company that believes that the internet will change the way the world works, lives, learns, and plays. And we have an aspirational goal that I realize is probably impossible to achieve, maybe, uh, to become the best company in the world and the best company for the world. 
We've completely changed our organization structure from command to control, which John, who's been my friend and partner in so many things for almost two decades, uh, which I love. Turn right, 67,000 people turn right without hesitation. But that's not the future. The future is around collaboration, teamwork, process behind that. And so that's why I'm so excited about what we're doing here today. And the reason I'm heavily involved is while we're doing very creative things at great universities at Stanford, Canley, at MIT, at Beijing University, what you are doing at Duke is the best out-of-box innovative thinking for not just the virtual classroom, but virtual learning with all the substance behind it. So I don't give out compliments that I really, really don't mean. But I think what you're seeing today is innovation in process and unbelievably good execution. And whether it's from the commitment at the top from Dick's level, uh, Blair from yours, or from Tracy's on making it happen behind the scenes, uh, I think we're all witnessing what I think the future will be. And while it sounds like toys and rocket science today, Dick, uh, five years ago I switched the headquarters here at Cisco from my first floor being 50 customers a day I would meet with on visits to my second floor is my virtual classrooms. I spend more time on the second than the first. We do 7,800 of these type of meetings a week as a company. So it is the future that's changing rapidly. So, so John, one more, and then if I could get John Doerr for you to comment on this in a way. First of all, just John, I want you to know that we are deeply proud of the partnership with you. And without the support you. you gave, we wouldn't be able to have this room. And so thank you for all you've done. And you know, of course, we're going to have to replicate it seven times around the world. So, so you will receive the payback <laughs> for this investment. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and, and, and a bunch of team rooms and seminar rooms I was describing to group. But sort of, how do you envision, there, both of you actually have interest in healthcare, you have interest in environment, you have interest in education. Do you know, speak to how you think those parts of the world are going to be radicalized with the kinds of things we're seeing here? I'll go first. Do you yeah, want to take it away? Um, I think what you're finding is the internet and education are the two equalizers in life, and they truly are. That a lot of the innovation today, which used to occur in Western Europe or America, actually occurs in the uh, emerging markets. And then if we're smart as countries, we very quickly bring those back and expand them here. Healthcare will allow us to receive the best healthcare from the best professionals all over the world in delivering this type of capability. And the first site of this type was actually in Sichuan province after the earthquake, where 374,000 people were injured, 85,000 killed. And we went into the location in partners with a number of global organizations and the leadership in China, build out an, a healthcare system of the future using this type of technology. We immediately took it, brought it straight to Cisco. This is what we do at our headquarters. And we announced two weeks ago doing it throughout California uh, with Governor Schwarzenegger for pilot systems to be able to address the underserved or underinsured. It will completely change health care and it will be a collaborative approach to it as opposed to just a doctor to a patient on the approach. I think there's no way to uh, uh, top what you are doing on education and if you watch what you're doing today, it will be within five years. This will be what our K-12 through system should be like. So I think it is the pilot and the model but it speaks to how it's a combination of public-private partnerships, but really dramatically transforming and reinventing thinking out of box with discipline and process how the future is going to be. So John Doerr, John, your, your turn. Son? Uh, sitting next to John, we shouldn't take for granted. In fact, we should focus on the importance of broadband for innovation in these really okay. socially important fields. Uh, this conversation we're having today, we couldn't do without I'm going to guess six megabit connectivity mm -hmm. between our two different sites. Pretty and accurate so, guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, tablet computers and iPhones and iPods, all these rely uh, essentially on uh, bandwidth and connectivity. And I think they will transform education in ways we can clearly see. Uh, the state we're in today, California, spends a billion dollars a year on textbooks. That's cutting down trees, right, and smearing ink on the paper and, and going through approval committee. And that's going to become a distributed system. And courseware will be authored by professors, and it will be tailored for the interests of the students. And uh, uh, you know, a decade from now, we're going to look back on these textbooks and think about how quaint they are. Just like <laughs> records. Just like records. Just like the iPod uh, transformed music. 
So uh, we're in the midst of a headlong rush still to go digitize everything and to uh, uh, connect all of this uh, by means of a uh, faster, better, broader bandwidth network of all the times. And what I said about education applies to healthcare, it applies to innovation in clean energy. I want to say one more word about clean energy because in addition to all this connectivity, there, there's two other forces that are uh, uh, driving that field into hypergrowth. One is, again, technology, the science of the small, our ability to manipulate materials at the nano level, our ability to get in and mess around with the metabolic pathways of bugs so we can re-engineer them to eat sugar and excrete clean biodiesel. Those are innovations that are going on right here, right now. But the other trend uh, that's powerful is urbanization. And uh, the fact is that between now and 2050, the most powerful trend on our planet is we're, we're going to see 4 billion people move from rural settings into urban settings. And, and how we construct those cities and the kinds of choices that we make, that they make, we collectively as a planet, are, are going to uh, affect literally the quality of the planet. And we're going to use communications, and we're going to use digitization, and we're going to make choices, I think, better than the choices we made in the Western world. Otherwise, we're going to uh, choke, pollute, and poison this planet of ours to death. So innovation, <coughs> broadband, urbanization, these are very powerful forces that are going to affect health, the environment, and, and education. So. So, John Doerr, this is, if we could stay on that, um, you know, it, last time John Chambers was talking that I was listening to, he was talking about the fourth utility, right, that actually broadband and all the things that hang off of it are actually the other utility that we're going to need to have. And you spoke to that as a requirement in the new cities that we built. Uh, one of the things I worry a little bit about is that um, we haven't shown a great capacity to plan our cities well now. <laughs> and, and that kind of utility thinking of how do you, how do you actually think a, rethink a city around its electronic interconnectivity is a non-trivial task. I, so, so two questions for you. One of them is, what do we have to do to get that right, I guess? And then the second one is, what are the things, what are the rate limiting factors that you see in, in the world you just described? <clears throat> well, uh, to the first question, I think the uh, choices in cities will have to do with communication, with uh, transportation, uh, with energy, and uh, with uh, sources of, uh, of and, and disposal of, of, of water as critical resources. And, and these choices are going to be made in Asia. If we're going to have 4 billion people okay. over 50 years move from rural settings to urban settings, those aren't choices we make in America. Uh, that, that's the equivalent, if you just want to run the numbers on it, of creating in Asia eight new Manhattans a year, eight new cities of 10 million people apiece. And so you look to the Chinese and you look to Indians, the Indians and, and other uh, countries in Asia, and these are going to be distributed cities. They're going to rely on distributed electricity and distributed communications. Uh, uh, they will rely much more on renewable energy resources th than we have in, in the West. And, and one hopes the early signs are that they're going to be uh, more energy efficient than the cities that we've built, uh, denser with uh, uh, more effective public transit systems. Uh, but it's a great challenge. And uh, I think it, it's up to innovators such as the students in this audience and the engineers on the campus to, to have a, a large say about how we do that. Now, what was your second question? The, what's, what's going to limit it? Where do you see it not? What, what are the factors that might make, make the world you describe happen? Right? Because you've described a fairly complex set of interdependent decisions that need to get made. What's going what's, what's to potentially stop it? Because so, part of the way these so, so I think three things have to come together. Uh, the first is we've got to get the policies right. And for example, when, uh, when China says that every municipal official will be judged not only on economic growth, but also on how they've achieved the country's green objectives, uh, the, the nation's uh, uh, leadership pays attention to that. That, uh, that very much matters. Policy, therefore, is really important. Uh, another thing that's crucial is investment, because right now these clean technologies are all more expensive under today's accounting systems than those uh, dirty old fossil fuels. And, Having energy and, and being able to meet the needs of, of uh, your billion people matters enormously to the leadership of China and the leadership of India. 
So we've got to have better batteries, we've got to have cheaper biofuels, we've got to generate solar energy with, with far higher efficiency, and all that requires engineering, that all requires science. And then once the inventions have been made, uh, the third requirement, right, policy, innovation, is investment. And there is no way that all the governments in the world can possibly solve this problem. They can create the environment, but we've got to rely on private capital, the, the, the powerful forces of markets, which I, I know we live in and study in your school all the time, to solve this problem. More money flows through private capital markets in a day than through all the governments in the world in a year. So if we don't take certain really clear steps together as a world to harness and make it attractive to invest in this new future, I can guarantee you it won't happen. So let me switch then and uh, John Chambers, actually, if you and John Dore could just have a conversation about this for a minute and just see how the dialogue goes and watch it. We've got some students here that, that you'd be incredibly impressed by. They're really great business students and they care. Right. One of the things that's happened with Fuqua is we've, we've attracted students who care deeply. They buy this notion that we create leaders of consequence. And so the sorts of things you spoke to would resonate deeply with this audience. Um, so and some of them are, want to do social entrepreneurial work, some of them want to do entrepreneurial work, some want to go work for big firms and see how they can get big firms to reconfigure, and some want to go work and do policy work and NGO work. But they're all great business people who care and want to create the future we want to live in. Right. What sorts of things would you have them think about as they start that journey, given the world we now live in? Mm, that's a great question. I was hoping we could offer them some advice. You want to start, John? Well, yeah, but I have a question <laughs> for you, John. Uh, John and I have worked together uh, for two decades, and we formed TechNet. We work on corporate social responsibility together. But, John, I think one of the most important things that, whether it's the cities of the future, uh, or whether it's the new technologies, you've always been able to anticipate what they would be five, ten years before it became obvious. How have you transformed your organization? Because that's what each of us have to do as leaders. Very few leaders reinvent themselves. Very few companies reinvent themselves. You've been able to do that. And what is unique about Kleiner and the way that you've done it? Because for the benefit of the audience, we interface to all the venture capitalists around the world. This is the best venture capital firm, both on execution, but also the best on corporate social responsibility, and one that when you have a handshake, it's done. Uh, your all's ethics are off the charts. How did you evolve? How did your team evolve? Well, that's a good question. I haven't uh, thought about it a lot until now. It's been, mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe okay. it's, it's been instinct. The, uh, but it's certainly been a team effort. Mm -hmm. The. Uh, Venture capital business, for those of you who are interested in it, is, is a business that does not scale. It's a service industry. And so our job is to help support the engineers and scientists and founders of businesses that uh, when they have something that appears to work really well, you can recruit an amazing executive, God, I wish I could, like John Chambers, to come in to run it. And so it's, it's not a business that can scale because there's only so much time in a day. What I would say is key to the talent <clears throat> that we've built Kleiner Perkins around is we're service oriented. Uh, my partners are all super smart. They uh, are entrepreneurs or executives. They really have operating experience. So we are not financiers. I ran more discounted cash flows at Intel than I have since I've come to Kleiner. Uh, and, and so we love technology. We love entrepreneurs. And honestly, also, we're all salesmen. I believe everybody in a sales or, or women, salesmen and women, everybody in a sales organization, a small organization, a startup organization, is always selling in an incredibly credible way to solve the problems or meet the needs of others. Everybody. So the purchasing agent in a startup company is trying to get the vendors to help them solve their problem. Uh, the, the, the receptionist at the front desk is, is the face of the company. So. My advice to uh, MBAs on, on the verge of graduating or planning your career is, is, is a couple points. Network like crazy. You are right now, every day, building networks within the school, outside the school. And, when, and so when you have the chance to interview, over-interview. Keep the business cards of the people you meet and stay in touch with all of them. Uh, my second piece of advice is while you're at uh, Fuqua School, learn technology. Go audit, even if you don't get credit for it, a, a course that interests you in the School of Engineering, in the life sciences, or in communication. 
uh, because the future is going to involve innovation, and I think you want to be grounded in, in, in those. And it's not as complicated as people might have you believe. Uh, uh, I, I, you're you're going to learn to be a lifelong learner, and, and I suggest that some form of science or technology is, is, is crucial. What would you say in the form of career advice? Well, I, I think the most important thing you do as a leader uh, is an ability, my CEO job is for yep. vision and strategy of the company, right. develop and recruit the team to implement that vision and strategy. Third one, I did not understand when I first became CEO, culture, and fourth, communicate all of the above. You can call it sales or whatever. But as you think about things, it's the ability to catch market transitions and to be part of those transitions that separates companies or individuals, whether you're in giving back to the world or whether you're forming a, a, a great startup or hopefully a company that really scales. And it's catching those transitions, having the courage to bring together teams and then mm -hmm. really move with speed. To the point that, John, you talked about, uh, it's the ability, the issue will never be technology. Right. It's process and culture that are the difficult things to change. So on the cities of the future, the best model in the world is Songdo outside of Korea. Uh, they are doing everything integrated together. They are doing their security, their uh, environmental issues, their traffic flow, their health care, their education, putting these systems uh, layer into each of the homes of every one of the new cities. It will generate probably 225,000 new permanent jobs that are not created in traditional cities mm -hmm. and add, according to President Lee, who's a good friend in, in South Korea, uh, probably 1 to 3 percent to the GDP growth. Uh, right behind it will be Chongqing in China, uh, uh, probably up in uh, Xiazhuan province will be the next one, then we'll see India. Our challenge is how do we get that in the U.S., because in the U.S. and Europe, we think of silos. We think of right. smart grids here, mm -hmm. and we think of traffic flow here, and we think of security here, and we think of education over here and healthcare over here. It's the power of bringing those together that I really think are going to uh, determine which countries uh, lead and which uh, economies have the best standard of living. Put in a positive way, however, maybe for the first time ever we can address three billion people making less than three dollars a day and make them part of the, the future economy, not just migrating to the cities, but uh, uh, changing their standard of living, which is good for all of us. That's inspirational, isn't it? I mean, it, it is. Just it makes is, you want is. to get up in the morning and go work <laughs> on that agenda. I, I thank you for sharing that, John. So I got a couple more pieces of, of, of uh, career advice for MBA students, which is worth exactly what you're paying for it. <laughs> Nothing. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 Your sense of humor is getting better. Yeah. I, I think uh, when you're choosing uh, where you're going to go build your career, where you're going to take on your uh, first or next assignment, I would do that to optimize around learning as opposed to how much the job pays. I remember when I was rolling out of business school, not very sure about what I was going to do, Everybody in my class went to work for fancy consulting firms or, mm -hmm. or, uh, or, or, or uh, Wall Street firms. And I was the only one with an engineering degree that went to work for a little chip company by the name of Intel as a sales engineer. And so I, I went there because I thought there were really great people who would invest time in me and in my development. And I thought it was going to grow a lot. Go to a place that grows a lot creates a lot of opportunity. A decade later, I might have tried to work at Cisco, same reason. Grow a lot, a lot of opportunity. My second uh, suggestion to you is really very personal and practical. And that is, I believe in the business setting, you're going to be judged more than anything else on your ability to think and speak on your feet in groups. Yes. And there's a reason for that. And that's a change, John, because yeah. our generation, many of the great leaders were actually behind the scenes, very good operationally, thought really well, empowered right. others. That has changed forever. Uh, regardless of your position, communication skills is, and half of the communications is listening. <laughs> but communication skills are now at the forefront for what I look for all the leaders at Cisco. It doesn't matter if they're engineers, HR, manufacturing, sales. That it becomes very, very key in ways that it was not just a decade ago. So, so you know if you are uncomfortable speaking in front of groups, large or small. You know if you're skilled in listening or not, and really. Uh, connecting in an active way with what's being said. And if you are, fix that. Fix that right away. Go take courses. I got thrown out in the field by Intel. They gave me a million dollar sales quota. I didn't know how to sell and I was terrified. I thought I'd get fired. So I signed up, this sounds really hokey, for a Dale Carnegie School of Selling in Chicago. And I, I learned how when you get the order, yeah, 
They didn't teach me this at Harvard Business School. We, we do at Fuqua, John. Order, you shut up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they, they, t they taught me that the way to get the order is to solve a problem. It's yeah. not to have steak knives in your trunk to take to the purchasing agent. And, and, and these are really fundamental skills, and I don't think it matters whether you're a Baker scholar or not. I think what's going to matter is your ability to communicate in the fullest sense that John said for the following reason. Ideas are easy. It's execution that's everything. And this is the most important. It takes a team to win. So if you're going to be a team leader, you need to be able to communicate and inspire and motivate and confront problems without confronting the people. You need to have this whole uh, uh, arsenal of communication skills. And uh, with that, I guarantee you, you'll go out and change the world. You have a big impact on it. So yeah, I, we don't okay. talk at times for six or 12 months, and we can almost finish each other's sentences, even though we come in it differently. You would think in Silicon Valley it would be all about innovation. And while innovation is important, it's really execution. What Jim Collins' uh, work is showing is that execution trumps innovation every time. But the world-class organizations will do both, whether it's in education or in business or in government. It's the ability to innovate and then have that execution machine. And Really, that's what you're seeing today. This team executed better than any university I've ever interfaced to to accomplish what you did today. And, and candidly, you, a year or two ago, I wasn't so sure, Blair. <laughs> that was uh, you weren't the alone, John. The scenes. I know you're paddling like crazy <laughs> underneath the water, but it really is working. It is. It is. So, John Darrow, I'm, I'm sensitive to. We promised we'd only steal half an hour, and I think we've taken it. Um, we have the Dean of Divinity School in the room, and so I'm just wondering if you have a benedictory comment or two before you go. You might already have made them, but do you have any thoughts? I mean, because around either advice or where you see the world going or um, the role Duke has, because the next question I was going to put to John Chambers, if you want to stay and think about it, is. We sit in the southeastern United States, and much of the action you just described is happening in places other than the southeastern United States. Um, what is our role? What's your advice to us about how we should try to help play and shape and make the world you're describing work better? Well, you know, the, the, the brains are, roughly speaking, evenly distributed around the world. There's quite a concentration of them there at Duke. Uh, I've, I've been there. We work for Duke. We have some of your endowment. We're trying to make 10 or 100 times your money. Um, <laughs> you, you have, Dick was smiling on that one. You, you have tremendous talent in the university. I, I got to know Christina Johnson before Steve Chu. You know, kid, you know, well, she went to Hopkins, and now she's in the Department of Energy. Yep. I think you have all the ingredients you need at Duke to innovate, to take risks, and, and I'd emphasize a kind of entrepreneurial culture. And that happens in the southeast of, of the United States of America. It does. There's a lot of it in Silicon Valley because of the connections between the universities mm -hmm. and, and the large corporate role models. And the venture capitalists. And venture capitalists. And supportive government. And supportive government. But, you know, uh, Research Triangle Park, that's the same latitude and longitude of Duke. So it, it can be and should be done. I'm sure it's being done. We can do more of it at Duke. So I'd be extraordinarily externally connected, as you're doing with this very technology and call. And, and, and I would uh, honor risk taking, honor folks who are entrepreneurs. Uh, I got one more thing to share with you, and, and that's, uh, you've heard of Moore's Law and you've heard of Metcalf's Law. I'm honored to have as my partner a guy by the name of Bill Joy, who's the smartest guy I ever met. Mm -hmm. For those of you who are computer scientists, you may know he put the TCP IP stack into Unix, and he founded Sun Microsystems and invented the Java programming language. But Joy's law is the following. He says, John, no matter how good your organization is, be it Cisco or be it Google, if you don't, in your team efforts, find a way to tap all the innovation that's out there, what's out there, if you can't leverage that onto your platform or your agenda, you are going to lose in the worldwide rate race to be an innovator. So I, I come back to a place where I began. I encourage you all to be incredibly externally focused. Uh, cruise the web. Figure out what your right websites are. Read voraciously uh, and, and, uh, and network like crazy. And, and I'm confident you will find uh, your passion and, and, and a way to uh, both personally prosper and do work that is significant as well as successful with the great career you have ahead of you. Thank you, John. Thanks. Yeah, okay. I, we I think on know. this note, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scoot on out of here.
Uh, and, uh, and I'm very grateful for the time to spend with you. Thanks. Thank you, John. So, so, John Chambers, he has to be really good at processing email quickly. The only other person who has ever done that is the is your customer at P and G, who um, and and he turns it around in like a minute after you send him email. It's amazing. So, um, so, so let's see how we can get this to work interactively, right? You've been talking to me, and it's been a little boring. Let's get let's get the folks involved here, right? So, if we okay. can, um, let's let's start with questions. But first, Tony, uh, just to sort of illustrate how it works from your neck of the woods out in Delhi at this late hour, um, do you want to go first? Why don't you throw a question in? Sure. So, in the conversation that was just going on. The, the linkage to the strategy that, that uh, you've been leading us through, Blair, in the globally distributed business school, um, the thought about you know, Alvin Toffler's quote that says, as we move from factory work to anytime, anyplace work, we need an anytime, anyplace educational alternative. Here we are, right? So, so this is the contingent from India, as you said. Um, and I started thinking about some of the things that John and John were both sharing. We were fortunate enough, as you well know, because you were here physically, in meat space, as we like to say, uh, with Nandan Nilakani talking about the Universal ID Project, right? So my mind immediately goes to the fact that if you're a globally distributed business school, as Sam Pamasano used to like to say at IBM, there's no home and away anymore. So the fact that we were fortunate enough as Duke University to have Nandan Nilakani or the managing director of Harley Davidson speaking to the CCMBA course, with a technology like this, <coughs> The ability then to, to distribute that across so that those of you in other parts, you know, we're going to have a, a number of campuses, it just becomes natural. I think one of the things we're experiencing right here is just how natural it is. Cognitively, we process in 3D, we always have. And, and this, to my way of thinking, is a much higher fidelity. Geography is history here. We're there with you, you're there with us. And as we bring the globalization of education and a globally distributed mindset, the things that John and John were mentioning about communication. Our students today have the fortune of being out in India, going through what we call a cultural dash. And some of the big challenges they were facing is, how do I communicate with the people out there to ask them and be culturally sensitive to that? And the ability for us to share that in real time here, it's just the mind boggles us to the opportunities one of the things I worry about as a student of technology is the notion of routinization. The idea that we'll take an existing technology to automate the past, bad assumptions and all, right. when in fact we can, go from, we can go from Twitter to telepresence and how we creatively blend all those technologies together and think differently about what education means. Um, you know, I, I could go on and on. So, so, so unbridled enthusiasm and great passion for, for where we can take this. So, John, could you do a riff on that, if you don't mind, the sort of where Tony went, which is if you take this kind of technology and you take the, some of the cool stuff you're doing around asynchronous technology in your labs that I hope we get our hands on sometime, um, mm -hmm. because it's, it's the ability to interact with them both here and also when they're at home simultaneous is going to make it really, really neat. Um, mm -hmm. Can you just do a riff on where you see education going and the kinds of things we should be thinking about? Yeah, it, it's interesting. The problem will not be technology. It will be getting the process change uh, and having a replication to the process change and then changing cultures. That's one of the reasons I personally believe that the emerging markets will be where the movement occurs quick and then candidly, do we have the courage in America and in Western Europe to take what is done there and bring it back and, and build it off in terms of the direction? You're absolutely right. With IT systems, if all you do is do automated what was done before, you miss the window. Uh, if you look where things are going and put it in the fun term, uh, for the sports of the future, uh, we did the whole Dallas Cowboys Stadium. We were there with President Bush, uh, with Jerry Jones, the owner, when it opened up. Uh, everybody focused on John Madden, that group. We were sitting beside the president. The point I'm making is the technology is what makes it go. Same thing with the Miami Dolphins, same thing with the New York Yankees, ESPN, 3D, it is changing. But it's that experience which we all know that like sports that calls 3D in the home to occur, you will see these systems in the home this year early stage. And it's the ability suddenly to lead. 
And um, Nandan Nenoikani is one of the top business leaders in the world. I'd encourage him to bring him into one of these future sessions. There's another person there by the name of M, uh, as M. Prem J at Wipro, who's probably one of the most humble people, but boy, he's really good on vision and direction. Or Robin Lee at Baidu in, in China. And you suddenly think about going around and taking an Ian Livingston at, at BT in, in London. And the ability to educate that way is key. Now, the key takeaway that Duke is doing is instead of you viewing this as a fear and how do we defend our campus in Durham as you make it a virtual university, virtual classrooms, and on the edge where whether it's the person attending from the dorm room or halfway around the world, they can participate in ways that haven't been done before, I think will entirely uh, be the future of education. And it will go quickly into the K through 12 with the same type of implementation if we have the courage to do it. Yeah, we're going to run an experiment here, by the way, John, with a class here and a class somewhere else, and we're probably in China in Kunshan that we'll be doing yes. K through 12 as an experiment. We'll show you how it, we'll tell you how it works. Um, well, so, this is what we like. We can change the world together, and yeah. that isn't a statement of dream. We do uh, uh, in in the industry. So, questions? Put your hand up. I'll call on you, uh, Peter Lang. And uh, if you could push the button and say who you are, that would be great. Hold it. You got to hold it down here. All right, I do. I do want to ask a question that goes back to something that was said uh, said earlier, John. You said get the policies. Yes, is that? Working? Yeah. Hold yeah. it down. Keep holding. Get the policies right. Get investment. John Dor said this, and get innovation. And the the one thing that occurred to me, what's missing in all of that, and that you keep coming back to, which is process. And I think the thing that's missing is institutions. Okay, the way things are structured, because those decisions. Uh, this, is, this is kind of a pitch from the outside, right? So the thing that we're missing is how do we design the institutions to be able to get the policies right, especially? Uh, and I think that that's when you mentioned the, the, uh, the emerging economies, it's actually they have more opportunity to get those institutions right than do some of the more established economies, just as I think Duke has more opportunity to get its institutions right, its internal structures right, as compared to some of the more traditional universities. So that I, I just would argue that the element that's missing there, but that ultimately has a huge determinative effect on the outcome, is the structure of the institutions and the ability to structure the institutions appropriate to the problem which you're trying to solve. I would agree. But I think it's a level playing field, if I can have a fun give and take here. Uh, I don't think there's a given winner of which country will have the highest economic growth rate or the best standard of living or the best corporate social responsibility or the best inclusion of all their citizens. I think it's about who does the innovation and execution right. Uh, Peter, to build upon it, one of the reasons that I'm so fascinated by this partnership is the commitment from the top. Dick, from the very top, not saying I'm committed, but being involved, doing the sessions. Blair, I have the flip video of you in your jeans the other day <laughs> testing the system after you got off the plane. The ability to take risk and sometimes not work. The courage to remodel your jet engine as you're flying. Because what we're doing today, we haven't practiced this. No, no. And having the courage <laughs> to be able to go through it. And no, Tracy, it may crash and burn. Uh, but it's the willingness to be out on that leading edge. And that's why I personally think America has should lead in this next decade as it had in the past. But it will be based upon the universities, business, government having the courage to do it, having no fear, but a lot of healthy paranoia what can go wrong. But we want to make sure that when things do go wrong, Dick, that we have patience, both from your side and my side, to say what do we learn from it, and then let's go forward on it. Questions? Others? From the audience? Yes, Jean-Pierre. Uh, is this on? Yep, it's on. You've got to hold it. Uh, great. So my name is J.P. Hill. Um, Mr. Chambers, you got to call me John. My dad's oh. Mr. Uh, when I get old and formal, we'll, we'll refer to us that way. <laughs> okay, fair enough, John. Um, you know, what you've done at Cisco has been amazing, changing it from command and control to, you know, a system of boards and committees. We're going to be entering companies, you know, at ground level. Uh, what do you recommend or how do we start having those conversations to make that transition? You know, is it something that, uh, just occurs naturally? Is, is there a group at Cisco that brought it to your attention? Uh, how do we get that ball rolling? Hey, John, while you're thinking, I just I want to highlight one companies cool in the future who do not have the capability to really attract the talent who are used to multi-processing with many concepts at the same time, the Facebook, the YouTube, uh, 
uh, tweeting back and forth at the same time, the video exchange. While I used to consider that rude, I actually, we built it into how we do our education in classrooms and uh, internally, and we built it into our organization change. So I think the companies who don't begin to put that type of capability in won't attract the people in this room and be able to retain you long term. However, it does require both pressure from below and pressure from above. Uh, it ha you have to have a CEO and a top leadership team who believes in it, because otherwise you're going to be pushing a rock up the hill that will never get there. And you have to have a culture that accepts change and a culture that is willing to have open communications. For example, my 29-year-olds uh, in the company came in and, and, and at home said, John, you're getting obsolete with not uh, uh, being willing to blog. And I said, I talk 200 words a minute, I do video, why would I ever want to blog at 10 words a minute? And they said, well, try video blogging, which is the way I now communicate to everybody in the company. Probably do four to five video blogs a day in terms of uh, the implementation. So you've got to have the courage to listen to change. And it may surprise you, my kids who are now in the late 20s and one of them just turned uh, 30 uh, are obsolete as far as giving me advice because they think on four or five tasks at one time. Uh, your younger uh, members of your family who are in the 10, 12, 14 age group, they do seven, eight, nine tasks at the same time. So if we think what we're doing today is unique, beginning to combine what I would call uh, some very creative video interface. I do this with nine countries at one time on a regular basis with my leaders in each group. We've got to think faster on how we do it and implement it through. JP, it's a long way of saying companies and governments have to have this in their beginning to attract the, and keep the right talent. But we've also got to get the leaders who understand process how to drive it top down. That's the responsibility of great universities, candidly of great government leaders, and of business leaders to do it. If you watch what John and I do a lot, whether it's with the NGOs of the world or the groups that are giving back or with government leaders, we spend a lot of time learning together. Each of us adds something different in terms of the direction. And it would surprise you, the people that he called on probably a week or two when he was in Washington, I know were probably the identical ones that I called on when I'm there. You identify the thought leaders, you drive it top down. All right, other questions? Blair? Yeah. Tony, was that you? Tony, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to, I just wanted to throw something in there because in this concept, and, and then I'm going to ask some of, of the Indian students, uh, the students who are here in India to, to, to comment on it. One of the concepts, as you talk about being innovative in terms of learning, one view of learning is our, our role is to pour knowledge into people's heads. Another view of learning that we're trying to percolate in the notion of CCMBA is one taking advantage of the, ge the geographic context, but the other is taking advantage of the cohort. So another way to think of learning is tuning your network to the problem at hand, which I think goes very tightly back to some of the, the sage advice that John Doerr gave to us. So for instance, here in, here in the CCMBA residency today, John, you'll be, John Chambers, you'll be happy to hear that the students were running around with flip cameras. And part of their task is to kind of capture the historical legacy of the region in the culture playing out today. The next thing they do is put that up, put that up <laughs> with the flip camera with Coach K on it. All right. uh, so oh, I do the same yeah. thing. Good man. The next thing they do is they put that up on an open forum, uh, AKA a blog, and yes. they co their colleagues have the opportunity to then comment on that. And, and we, we, we have a processing through the individual layer, which is how am I assimilating into this culture. We have it through a regional layer, which is what is the cultural dimensions of this region, what does it mean to be. And then finally, we landed on a business perspective that says, so what does that mean for me to be a leader of consequence across regions? So we're trying to thoughtfully position the notion of, of education, bringing the peer group experience in, and leveraging the technology affordances all the way from Twitter to telepresence mm -hmm. to, to just allow that to be so. So any comments from the Indian uh, or questions? I, I have a question. Um, Casey Windsor, thank you. And I, I think this technology is quite visionary. I, in response to what Tony was saying, you know, what we're learning a lot is that education isn't necessarily linear. It actually is circular, and it becomes this process where yes. you feel like you learned something, you've gone to a point, and then you reevaluate, you reassess, and then you find that actually you don't know as much as you did know, and, and you're learning more. And so I think in a technology like this, there could be a, a potential challenge in that if you're expanding the scope, you're expanding access, but the, the way that that interaction occurs, I guess, is key in terms of 
having that learning be circular and the exchange be back and forth. I mean, certainly, you know, you can have a professor who teaches to the class, and it's a sort of a top-down approach. But I think the more people, and particularly if you're expanding scope and location, a technology like this, there may be some challenges to that if you have a lot of people in a room and how many people get to talk. And you certainly have the cultural part, too. And some people don't like to talk as much. So I see that playing, playing a part. But my question actually was more about, I definitely appreciate the idea to execution piece. And so execution is key. And when you talk about particularly in countries, developing countries, where capacity is dramatically different, there's huge disparities in terms of infrastructure, in terms of knowledge base. What do you see as being sort of the major opportunities and challenges for rolling this out? And who do you perceive as being the key partners and playing a role in helping you in that? Going in reverse order, uh, the emerging countries, almost without exception, that have decent leadership know that broadband, fixed or wireless, as John Doerr alluded to earlier, is their roads, uh, their airports of the past. And they get it. The key is how do they put the broadband in place, and then how most important do you put applications on it to go? Because if all you do is put in the infrastructure and you don't help them change their health care, their education, bring jobs to the area, or even worse, you train their people very well, there are no jobs, they leave the country. You have to do all of them in combination. And that's where corporate social responsibility and partnering goes hand in hand uh, with the ability to do this. President Clinton, uh, prior President Clinton, the World Economic Forum is working with prior President Bush about 80. And uh, we as a company, are, we have our routers up in space, uh, uh, literally helping uh, bring the services to the remote part of Haiti with both the healthcare professionals as well as coordination and flow. Uh, we've given $2.2 million of our own money, individual monies to match it. We're changing process. but. President Clinton said it best. He said, we're, we're, I'm friends with both of the, the prior leaders. And they, they said, John, think about how you create jobs after the, everybody else forgets. Yeah, and you, you, the year or two will be refocused on Haiti. How do you change that country for the long term? I sent a note back to my uh, key operational person, Randy Pond. He formed a working group immediately on it. And within three days, we have our plans for what we're probably going to do subject to board sign off. Uh, in Haiti in terms of rough stages about how we change the country dramatically. It's a long-winded way of saying that what you're seeing today, while it looks like rocket science, it is old-fashioned old already. I do these sessions. I will tape them ahead of time. I will not only transfer with holograms capability, I will transfer in time as well and appear on stage in, in Brazil, and all the person on the other end has to know is stay on script and don't step on me. And while that sounds unique, that will be changing very, very rapidly. To your point about time, video is one element, but we will use uh, interactively the uh, discussion forums that operate on a 24-hour day, day basis. The ability to rate what you say and to be able, based on your colleagues, which sessions you watch and don't watch, did they add value or not. The ability to transfer voice in the network and therefore not only be able to search off of each of the uh, video sessions done, whether it's by the flip or by telepresence, but to push it to your common communities of interest who are focused on uh, a startup in the biotech area or a data center strategy or corporate social responsibility in Haiti. And it, it is just starting what you see. Now, the ramp up in the first phase of the internet to draw a parallel in terms of entering orders online, doing customer support online, had a ramp that was dramatic. Cisco led in both of those. We were probably two to three years ahead of, of all of our business partners. Uh, and you began to then see how it changed productivity for a decade from 97 through 2004. You're going to see the same thing. Our ramp up on YouTube internally, we call it Cisco Vision. It's moving to show and share type of scenario, is up 8,600 percent in 24 months. When we do these classes and we're experimenting with ourselves, we will have an instructor, Blair, leading the session or Tony leading it, but we will have, using my terminology, a teaching assistant who will be answering questions as you right. go back and forth, be able to be tar targeted. You will actually find the students will teach each other at the same time, and you have interactive sessions going on throughout the area. And while that sounds advanced, that is, is going to look old-fashioned a couple years from now. So going all the way back to what you're doing today, 
I think this is dramatic versus any other university in the world. I think it's leading edge and cutting edge. But we might think it's rocket science. In two years, it will be we've got to reinvent ourselves another time. So I love what you're doing, and, and it is really uh, an honor to be a small part of it. So let me just show a few things off and then get a question. So the people in Shanghai and John, I hope what you're going to see is that the professor is actually moving in the front of the room, and the camera mm -hmm. should follow the professor. Do you see? Do you now see me? Well, has it moved? the systems are off of not uh, motion. They're off of voice. So uh, as the, the professor moves, coming? she or is he coming? has to talk at the same time. Is it coming? No, it hasn't moved yet. All right, that's, uh, we've got to fix that. All right. Um, you should be able to see. It's actually a pad, John. There it is. You see? Oh, yeah. Uh, I heard about this. This is really cool. You basically got about voice and camera zooming and moving. So what you see is I'm just too light to trip the pad, right? This is it. <laughs> Uh, here we go. I was coming, so, Blair. I couldn't get you off it, and get it ahead of it. <laughs> so it basically will move with the instructor. So as we teach, you yeah. will move back and forth on direction. Exactly. One of, the, one of the challenges actually is related to the point, which is this feels pretty static. One of the questions is how do you get dynamism into this thing, right? The other one is it's, it's how do you of, get emotion. Exactly. It's fun to sort of think about how you get a debate going on so you can see the debate, right? So let's just for fun try something, right? Dave, I want you to say anything provocative, all right? And Marcy, I want you to disagree with him, all right? But, but let him hit the button first and hold the button while she does it. Go ahead, Dave. So say anything provocative. I do not like Duke basketball. Oh, there you go. Marcy, go, 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 go. <laughs> Hold it. You do not belong in this room. Get out. <laughs> so now hopefully what you saw, keep the hand down. Hopefully what you saw was the camera pan in on David, right? Dave, yeah. when he first did it. And then it spread out to Marcy so you could see the debate going on between the two of them. Is that what happened? I hope. It was pretty close, Blair. What you're also <laughs> seeing is this is stage one because the camera technology is not just coming down Moore's Law. It's coming down the ability to uh, adjust to it. So as you build these systems, you're way ahead of your counterparts in doing it, but you also each time will get better and better with the next generation technologies, which isn't three to five years out, it's 12 months out. Right. But I got it. You're able to all of a sudden teach, collaborate in very unique ways. So let's get another question. One more question. Yes, uh, Rob, hold it down. Um, John, hey. thank you very much for being with us today. Um, hey, so. Rob. I am a concurrent degree student here at Duke with the Nicholas School of the Environment and also with the Business School. And before coming to Duke, I worked for an investment fund that bought old brownfield properties or polluted factories, tried to clean them up and, and redevelop them. So with this conversation yes. we've had about um, really the smart grid and development abroad where there might be new development that I think is different than domestically. So I have a specific question about the smart grid here in this country. Um, yes. This is maybe for some of my colleagues, it was for me, it's the first time to hear a, a person in your industry talk about the smart grid and renewable energy. We hear John Doerr talk about it all the time. Um, I was actually at a meeting this morning with the, this state's Utilities Commission chair. It was a little yeah. less high profile than this particular meeting over at the Nicholas School and there were only a few people there, but he talked about incorporating broadband into the smart grid and the, the, the goal of the meeting was to discuss incorporating renewables into this grid in this country. So, in my previous firm, I learned the challenges of redeveloping domestically vis-a-vis -vis the potential ease of developing in a, in a planned way abroad. So as we think about the smart grid uh, here in this domestic country, I w wondered your opinion on what, how you or, or how broadband will incorporate with that, because we heard some interesting comments on that this morning. And also, if you could get Mr. Doerr back in the, the room, um, if we have, we have a small amount of capital as we graduate school, um, where, where should we invest that capital, or more specifically, with respect to our career capital, if we wanted to work in this redevelopment of a super grid, using Mr. Doerr's phrase, um, as smart grid and renewables come alongside of you folks with broadband, how do you think about that evolving in the next 20 years? Okay, so I'm going to answer a series of questions there. You ask about four if I counted them, and I'm going to tie it back into what <laughs> one of your colleagues asked earlier, and Tony, you referred Sorry. to. Uh, no, it's actually excellent because it's the right way to think. If, if you watch what gets government or business into trouble, they execute on a transaction. They don't paint what is the clear vision of where something's going to be 5, 10, 15 years out. Then you break it down, what's your differentiated strategy to get there uh, on it, and then you get down to execution, what do you do the next 12 to 18 months? What gets governments, business in trouble is when you start on execution and like a chess game playing out one move at a time, 
your competition who's playing the whole game out in their head, forward, backward, sideways, will always out execute you. To the second part, smart grid is probably going to be as big uh, uh, for the future as the internet was for the past. The connection of devices, uh, first for electrical reasons, but then for many, many other reasons, will scale way past what you've seen with the internet. Uh, smart grid is an element of just moving electricity around. It's exactly like the internet. It, you, instead of moving zeros and ones, you move electricity. You do it based upon its carbon footprint, the ability to tune it up or down in your building or in your home. The utility companies will pay you probably 40% uh, lower electrical bill to give them the capability to slightly turn things up or down during the peak times, which is where the majority of their expenses come in. So there's real solid financials behind it. As you think about where smart grid goes, however, uh, we're partnering, as, as you may or may not know, with a GE, uh, with a uh, Florida Power and Light, with a Duke Energy to really change this scenario. So it speaks together with groups working together that have not. Now, to give you an idea of what I'm after when the graduates come out of this MBA school, you might say, John, I want you to be able to run financial spreadsheets like John Doerr said, or I want you to learn how to get really good on your collaboration. And by the way, I was so scared coming out of even law school that uh, on major presentations, I'd throw up before I went in to do the presentations. <laughs> Speaking publicly takes practice, and it takes working on it and developing the skills and having techniques. Now, where I'm going, uh, Tony, was I want teams who know how to collaborate with others, knowledge sharing together. I want the ability to learn to be what you learn at Duke because I'm very likely to move you out of your core skill capability within two years after you're at Cisco. And I will take the example. My smart grid lead is a person by the name of Laura Ipsen. She has a unlimited blank check for whatever she wants to do here. Combination of acquisitions, hiring, strategic partnerships. She works for Martin DeBeer, who does my internal startups within the company. She comes with a background of government affairs, probably the best in the world on that, uh, she's fluent in Arabic. She has unbelievable people and communication skills, but she attracts talent. She worked on these collaborative councils in other areas, such as what we're doing in service provider, what we were doing in data center, what we were doing in corporate social responsibility. And over the last three years, she had learned how to understand sales and engineering and products. And I took her from my lead in government affairs and moved her straight in to my most important project, and she's hiring talent below her remarkably well. Skills that I want from this group around the room, the ability to learn. Collaboration, communication, leading, the ability to harness the power of your peers, and as John Doerr said, develop those relationships constantly. They will be of tremendous value to you in the future. And then have the courage to change and learn how to communicate that change, not in a way that's ineffective and really pisses somebody off at the other end, but in a way that you get the desired behavior that you're after to achieve your goals. So kind of tying it all together. In terms of the career, drop John Doerr an email. It will surprise you. He will absolutely get back to you on the thoughts and directions. It's what the Valley does. There's no protocol here. If you really engage effectively, people get back to you in terms of the value you add. Blair? So, John, I, I realize that we are about two minutes past the time that's decent for you, and so let me give you a benedictory option, too. But, but before I did, I just want to personally thank you for your support in getting this to happen. We, we, we did something, actually, that I find remarkable, which is decided December 1st that we were going to put this class together and have you here February 5th. We couldn't have made that bet if we didn't have your commitment and, uh, and the willingness to sort of bring all the resources of Cisco to bear on making it happen. And so we thank you deeply. We're going to do it many times. Um, and, and we're honored that you're the one who kicked it off. Um, so thanks to you and your whole team for us. With that, any last thoughts that you have, if you could just leave the class with anything, what would you say? Maybe two or three real quickly. Uh, Public-private partnerships are, are most effective uh, when they combine the skills of partners who come at a problem with different skill sets. To be successful, they are very much what you see here today. It has to start with commitment from the top, and it has to be not just a commitment at the CEO level, at the dean level, at the CIO level, but a culture that really wants to make that work. 
and it requires a partner who matches up the same way. It requires a clear vision of where you're trying to go for the future. And while today is exciting, watch what we do together three to five years out. We'll say, can you believe how, how you know, old world we were in our first session in terms of the direction? It does require clear roles and responsibilities with the appointment of project leaders to really make work and a regular review, Dick and Blair, by the top leadership and myself about how we're doing. Second key takeaway is we're all equal in this world. Uh, uh, the ability to always keep that in mind as you're successful. The people in this room are better educated than your peers. But if you really treat people all over the world like you'd like to be treated yourself, you develop that trust and open communication. And remember, in the end, it is your culture of trust that will probably allow you to get ahead much quicker than any other way. And you will all, including myself, make mistakes. Learn from those mistakes as you go forward. And I think my final comments would be, uh, this can change the world in education. But as you do it, there's no reason Duke shouldn't be synonymous with education everywhere in the world. Continue to dream big. I know the next uh, opportunity we'll do together is in China. I, th I think that will be a lot of fun, Blair. And it was an honor being uh, along with my very good friend. And you probably already saw trust. John and I would rather have a handshake than a $5 billion commitment in writing. Uh, that is what makes it go, and that's why I think this is not anything like the old world thought of distance learning. This is about collaboration, the virtual classroom, which will be virtual learning over time, Blair. So uh, if you've got one thing as a student today that was a value to you that would change your future, that's all we can ask for. If you got more than that, it was beneficial all the way around. Congratulations, Duke. We're proud of you all. And we're proud of you, and we look forward to doing this often, John. Take care. Thanks. Thanks. Have a great day. Now, I'm going to see if I can turn this off, all right? Just, uh, all right. Hey. All right. Um, I hope you sort of see the power of this, right? I mean, um, you couldn't see what's happening on the other side. It was really just, if we could get the debate going on in this room, they would actually have seen you focus on you, Dave, right? And then actually the rest of the two screens would have panned so you could see you disagreeing with him, right? Um, and you can actually get the sense of it. We didn't, we didn't show the motion, the capacity that it has in here. You can also have the case where the professor goes up and the professor is part of the class. So we didn't do it because... John and John are so valuable. We just we should have concentrated on them because they're just such. They are amazing people. Just think about this. We had the most interesting venture capitalists in the world, and probably the one of the most interesting IT people in the world, come to speak to us because we put this in. And uh, it's, you haven't seen anything yet. Uh, take care.